there's not anything disclosed, managers aren't making as many estimates or assumptions in, in their business. And this might be because of the nature of their business. And what the researchers found was that indeed there was an increase in earnings quality, and they measure earnings quality in many ways. Uh, and this is driven by firms that are subject to a low level of judgment. So when reporting under IFRS from their prior domestic gap, firms' earnings quality increase, but we see that primarily in firms that don't make a lot of assumptions and estimates and judgments. However, there is either no or weak improvement for firms with a high level of judgment. So there's ones that report um, more estimates and, and, and assumptions being used. Now, is this good or bad? It's hard to say, okay? Because moving from one standard to another um, and making estimates and assumptions is part of what managers have to do in companies, right? The world is not black and white. Financial reporting is not black and white. And so this, this, this leads me to the thought that it may, there may, it may be innately difficult to measure certain areas, especially those where judgment is needed, and that would be under any set of accounting standards. Okay? And this is why, in part, we are the experts, that we know it is difficult to understand and implement the accounting standards, and managers then, understanding the business, must do their best to do this, okay? knowing that they are making assumptions and estimates, but understanding where those are. Now when I think about this also, I think from a U.S. perspective of where there are uh, major differences between IFRS and U.S. GAAP. And the major differences include areas like property, plant, and equipment with asset revaluations or asset impairments. Um, accounting in the capitalization of research and development, accounting for contingencies, contingent liabilities primarily, some inventory accounting with LIFO, um, issues with pensions and other post-retirement benefits, and then some consolidation and group reporting, that these are significant differences. And when we kind of cross them with the graph from the IFRS reporters, we see in parentheses are the, the, the areas where we do see more judgments, estimates, and assumptions. Okay, So these are areas where financial reporting is different under you know, two high-quality set of accounting standards, or at least those I'm familiar with, um, where we do see estimates and assumptions. Okay? So it's interesting to, to note these items and ask, well, why are there these measurement differences between IFRS and U.S. GAAP? When in fact, we know that the conceptual frameworks are somewhat similar. The objective that I showed you for reporting under international financial reporting standards is very similar to, to U.S. GAAP. Well, in, in fact, at that time, it was the same. And the foundations are similar, although not totally the same. And yet we see some differences in, in standards that are, that are important. Um, and sometimes it, it's hard to, to determine in these areas where there is a lot of assumption, a lot of estimates, and a lot of uncertainty, what is the best way to account for an item. So as a standard setter, basing the accounting on a certain set of principles and the conceptual framework, you can, uh, different solutions or different answers might be arrived at, okay? Is there a best way to, to do the accounting? And which standard better reflects the underlying economics and then in what settings, okay? So even though there is, there are differences, I believe that the standard setters do look at when, given their principles and, and their priors, the best set under the circumstances that they are setting the standard, but knowing that there can be different methods or different choices that even at a standard setting level can be made. Okay. Okay. 
So that's the, more of the background on the objectives and the principles versus rules based, and to a little bit the path that would lead us down. I want to get back to some of the expected benefits under IFRS. We said the two major outcomes that, that countries might be seeking under IFRS are improvement in financial reporting quality and comparability. And then these benefits, these would have benefits to capital markets and to the greater society. But some of the benefits that they look for to capital markets might be a lower cost to capital, the increased ability to raise capital, increased ability to attract foreign investment, better financial information for financial statement users, improved transparency of results, enhanced comparability. These are all other benefits that have been have thrown out and, and given for IFRS. Um, and then at the company level, better management of global operations if we're all reporting under one and rolling up to one standard. And then better information for financial regulators and not only within a country, but across countries for cross-border uh, financing. Okay. So if these are some of the expected benefits, then what, what has research found? Or what do we, do we know that these, these benefits are actually happening? Okay. In terms of financial reporting quality, we could think of financial reporting quality in two different ways. One is the properties of accounting information. And there's been a significant amount of research done after the adoption of IFRS in many countries comparing properties of accounting information under prior domestic gap to properties of accounting information under international financial reporting standards. Okay. These would be for the European Union countries, for countries like Australia, Canada, and Taiwan. And this research has been a little bit mixed in terms of the properties of the accounting information itself. And in that there has been more earning smoothing, which has been viewed as not a positive uh, financial reporting property, and less timely loss recognition. Um, uh, again, not a positive outcome. However, there's been less earnings management towards targets such as analyst forecasts of earnings per share. Okay? Another way to think of financial reporting quality is to look at how well the financial reporting is in the capital markets such as in stock returns and stock prices. Okay, this is an alternative and almost a complementary way of looking at quality. So I'm a company reporting my net income and my book values. Is the market using this information? Are they using it more or less than they use the information under my prior domestic gap? And here the evidence is also a bit mixed, but more towards the usefulness of this information. That earnings, book values, and cash flows are more related to stock prices under international financial reporting standards than they have been under prior domestic gap, in general, on average. Uh, and that differences between international financial reporting standards earnings and book values and those from prior domestic gap are more related to stock prices. So, there appear to be capital markets benefits in terms of our market understanding and, and relying on this information to, to, uh, that is impounded in prices. Um, the properties of the accounting information, that one's a, a little more difficult. And part of the difficulty is that when we look at the properties of accounting information itself, compared to the prior domestic gap, our starting point there is prior domestic gap. And if we believe that that is a good benchmark, then this research is informative. However, if we do not believe prior domestic gap is a good benchmark, just because there are changes from what we saw under our, our domestic gap doesn't mean financial reporting quality is better or worse. It means there are changes in the information that are reported. So when I look at this evidence, 
and believe that the market valuation of the accounting information is critical, and the market use is critical, to get those desired benefits. We think about comparability. Um, comparability is defined in the conceptual framework of the International um, Accounting Standards Board that is used for development of IFERS. It's defined as a quality of information that enables users to identify and understand similarities in and differences between items. Okay? So that's what standard setters view of accounting comparability as. Um, to implement that as an accounting researcher um, is it, a little more challenging, but researchers have tried to do that. Okay? And what we found. is that we think about input measures, and those would be the information in the financial statement itself, accounting methods, financial statement ratios, um, they're in the financial statements. But these numbers appear to be more converged, at least when we consider um, comparisons across countries and across industries than they were under prior domestic gap. We think of output measures, again, think of how the markets are using this information, um, and the economic outcomes, as well as information transfers and cross-border information flows, here we see much more evidence that their information is more comparable. So it appears that investors are using this information under IFRS in a way that they had not been able to use information under prior domestic gap to transfer information and make decisions. Now, the evidence, this is the broad brush, the on average and general um, findings of this research. Um, it, there are some mixed results, but overall, these are the conclusions. Okay? Okay. Now, this is for financial reporting quality and comparability. But we need to step back and think, well, what are the benefits to the preparers? Right? Um, and there's research here that says that there's a lower cost of capital for companies, improved transparency, and there the market liquidity, um, bid-ask spreads have decreased, and there is more trading after the adoption of IFRS, increased comparability, which we just talked about. Um, so my own research looks at foreign investment and increases in debt and equity investment, as well as greater analyst following, so the information environment appears to be richer. Okay. There's a big caveat with some of this research as it relates to the preparers, in that at the same time that companies are adopting IFRS, they're also increasing regulation and the enforcement of regulation. So it's, it's sometimes difficult to attribute this to IFRS alone, but all of the changes that are happening in a country and in an economy to support and enhance the financial reporting do have these, appear to have these benefits. Okay. We would, now that's a preparer level. We move to a country level. Okay. So countries expect benefits in terms of capital markets developing the countries um, and a greater society. The research has found that capital markets benefits occur primarily in countries where firms have incentives to be transparent. So where there already is a rich information environment, uh, where there is um, information that is disseminated, um, and where there is strong legal enforcement. Okay? So adopting IFRS in countries where there is not strong legal enforcement has not shown to provide this promised benefits of IFRS. Okay? So these, these go hand in hand. <coughs> the adopting a new financial reporting system, as well as being able to enforce the adoption of that system. So this highlights the importance of the firm's reporting incentives to be transparent um, or to um, not be overly scrutinized and disciplined by the regulators in that where financial reporting um, is, is most enhanced is in those areas um, where countries have high enforcement regimes. Okay? And this goes to the point that accounting standards are only one element of the economic infrastructure 
but an important and critical element. So that was the good part. That was the benefits. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the cost, too, because the cost cannot be ignored, and certainly these have been quite frequently discussed. There are the initial costs of implementation of IFRS, the training of staff, the information systems that might have to be modified, the auditing um, of this new uh, reporting, uh, the costs there are increased. Um, there are investor management costs. So when I report to my investors under this new reporting regime, what do I tell them? Um, how do I manage their expectations under a new financial reporting system? Managers are concerned about revealing private information and competitive information. Um, there are the IT costs and function costs. Um, and I've done some research on uh, an additional cost um, of executive compensation. And I'll spend a little bit of time talking about this because it highlights some of the uh, underlying issues or concerns of IFRS to many. Okay. Not only does IFRS, we saw when we looked at the principles based and we looked at some of the requirements under IAS 1 with the judgment disclosures and the sources of estimations, assumptions, and uncertainty, that IFRS generally requires more extensive recognition and disclosure prior to prior home gaps, to prior domestic gaps. And in fact, there has been some research done uh, on countries that have adopted IFRS, and indeed, their financial statements have gotten longer. Okay, so there's more in their financial statements. Um, and there are benefits to increased disclosure, right? It can reduce information asymmetries and thus lower cost of capital which we've seen IFRS has, increased liquidity, which we've seen IFRS has done, can reduce fraud and theft, which is an open research area, um, and it can increase firm value. Okay. However, this increased disclosure does not come without cost. Okay? Because with increased disclosures, um, managers are often resistant uh, to make more disclosures because uh, it improves the ability of shareholders to monitor managers. Um, it decreases, then, their ability to extract private benefits. Uh, it reveals competitive information, um, as well as incurring all the accounting costs and efforts under a new system. Okay? So, at an executive level, if you're a CEO or a CFO of a company, this increased disclosure can adversely affect an executive. Um, and these, this adverse effect, though, can cause compensation to rise. Okay? Because we are monitoring managers at a greater level. Um, we're reducing their ability to extract benefits. So, to comp so we must compensate that, them for that and perhaps share some of the benefits of the increased capital, cost of, the decreased cost of capital, and the increased liquidity. Okay? And even with mandatory changes in disclosure, managers can capture some of the benefit with higher compensation. Okay? So I have a research study that asks, is executive pay after higher after the mandatory adoption of IFRS? And what that given these reasons of the disclosure. Now, there's some reasons why we would not executive, expect executive to pay to increase. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, with, okay, sorry. Okay. Um, there's some reasons why we would not expect executive pay to increase. I'll talk about those in a minute. But if investors and managers also have uh, increased responsibilities under IFRS. And if you you're with an IFRS company, or you've talked to somebody working at IFRS company that will report, we know that it's increased effort and higher personal risk under the new accounting regime because there are more complex standards than most domestic gaps. The idea of a principal standard and fair value standard might be much more difficult to apply and implement, especially given those estimates and assumptions that go into it. There's significant effort during the transition, right, to get up to speed on the new accounting standards and determine how they apply to your company to 
so that you can report under the new standards. And there's a chance of causing a mistake or an error in implementation because this is all so new to a company. Okay. So because of this increased responsibility, and because of these risks with this increased responsibility, we might expect here, too, that executives demand more pay. Okay. And in this case, though, because of the increased responsibility happening well before the reporting, this, this pay increase might be seen at the announcement of IFRS adoption rather than when we actually see the reports. Okay. And we expect this increase to be higher for CFOs who are primarily in charge of the financial and reporting functions of the company. So, if, oh, if I'm about to adopt IFRS, or if my company is about to adopt IFRS, I'm starting work today. I'm working with my auditors, I'm looking at the tax implications, I'm working with my IT team to best understand what this means for my company and how to report under this new standard. Okay. Now there's some reasons why we might not expect K to increase um, in that in many domestic gaps, financial statements are of lower transparency, managers have more leeway to manipulate numbers, which might lead to higher compensation under the old standards. So we might not see more K even though there's more disclosure and because of that greater risk to the executive. And also executives in a, in a country often face outside options um, in terms of their employment. As a result, they might not be able to um, bargain for higher compensation or working at another company. And if they work at another company, they'll face the similar or same issues. Okay. So what we find in looking at a large sample of countries and companies that adopted IFRS, this um, European Union companies in 2005, as well as Australia and Canada, uh, we find that after the announcement of the adoption of IFRS, executive compensation does indeed increase. Okay. Okay. Um, and this would support the higher disclosure theory. And the increase is positively associated with greater enforcement. So where there is more disclosure and there's an enforcement of disclosure, managers know that they are at risk of um, losing their private benefits. We also find that there is more, oops, there is a more of an increase, and I'm going over these very, very quickly, I know, that there is more of an increase for CFOs in their compensation who are, uh, who are more affected and who are in charge of implementing these new standards. Okay? So in addition to all the benefits of IFRS, and we do see them in the capital markets, we do see them in countries, there are some costs and some hidden costs that we, such as increasing executive pay that must be acknowledged and understood at the time of adoption and implementation. Okay? So as I conclude, I want to highlight two points that IFRS is one step to innovation and investor protection globally by providing better information to the capital markets, to potential providers of capital. Um, we are enhancing investor protection. Okay? Accounting standards are just one piece of this investor protection. The next steps, there are next steps that, that, that need to happen. Um, to further enhance and support investor protection. This has to come also with the laws to protect investors and investor protection rights. Um, changes in investor protection laws, changes in legal systems, will there be changes in stock exchange regulation with monitoring and enforcement. Okay? The accounting is just one piece. In terms of the research then the, uh, on IFRS, there are also continued innovations in our understanding of the implications of this financial reporting. Okay, there's this large stream of literature that we've touched on that examines the importance of standards uh, versus reporting incentives in a country. And this can be broadened to better understand these standards in, in the setting of the country laws and regulations, property laws, bankruptcy laws, 
pensions and pension funding rights. So that there's still much more work to be done as we understand the benefits and the costs of IFRS, um, but we, we do see it happening and we do see those benefits there. So thank you.